Chef, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for, for having me. Thanks uh, to all the creatures for the invitation. Um, so yeah, as uh, Christina just said, I'm Chef Van Galen. I'm a design researcher um, operating kind of in the mushy area between um, future studies and design uh, with uh, an interest and focus mostly on uh, what you might call regenerative ecologies. I'm interested uh, predominantly in versions of the future in which humans have a slightly better relationship with the natural systems that they live with than what we do now. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk about the Zoloc project, which I've been involved with for a couple of years now, and uh, some of the projects and workshops that I've been doing around that. Um, so with that, my face is now going to disappear and you get to look at my slides instead for the next half hour, 20 minutes-ish before we go to uh, a Q&A. Let's see, this will stop somebody else's sound share. Sorry, Lara. Yeah, let's share the screen and put this guy in presenter mode. Um, okay, so um, I basically all just said the stuff I was gonna say on the slide. Um, so to jump straight in, I'm first going to tell you about what the ZOOP actually is, because for some of you, this may be a completely new term. So the ZOOP is a, a, a concept for a new legal format incorporating collectives of humans and non-humans together as owner employees, um, which is maybe a bit weird terminology, but so ZOOP is a contraction of the ancient Greek Zoe for life and co-op, uh, short for cooperation. Uh, the ZOOP has two goals. These are to uh, strengthen the position of non-humans within human society, uh, expanding the capacity for them to act within the wider social fabric and to engender ecological uh, regeneration and uh, grow in a kind of way that's capable of exist, uh, resisting the extractivist dynamics of uh, the way economies are currently structured. Um, so the ZOOP is designed to function as a part of economic frameworks as we currently understand them, um, with an added aim to develop its own, what we're calling uh, the local zoonomy, the, the quality and density of relations within the local multi-species community. Um, so this idea is inspired by cases like the Whanganui River at uh, Urugera Forest and Mount Taranaki in New Zealand, which are three collective more than human bodies that have been recognized as living ancestors by the Maori for generations already. In New Zealand in the recent years, they were granted a legal personhood. So in legal terms, they're now incorporated non-humans represented by human members of local iwi when necessary. Um, the ZOOP doesn't work or aim to uh, try to have this long-term process of granting rights to, to natural entities, um, but it's a procedure for representation and collaboration within organizations that can be implemented uh, more directly. Um, so we're going to circle back to this and you can ask me more about the way this is structured. But uh, I think it's interesting to actually tell the origin story of the ZOOP, um, as we're here to talk about the value of creative practices for transformational futures. So um, that's what I'm going to do in this first section of this little talk. Uh, so here you have um, what you might recognize as the output of some kind of workshop, a whole bunch of post-its and scribblings on a very large piece of paper. And this was uh, what a group did in a workshop at Hadnew Institute in 2018, the first in a series of three that year called Terraforming Earth. And in this workshop, Constitution of a 21st Century Society, um, we were looking at exploring new modes of citizenship that might include non-human entities and uh, extrapolate possible economic and ecological effects. Um, so if I zoom in and flip this upside down, you get uh, this little highlight where for the first time uh, the word bio co-op appears. And that was what this idea was called uh, for the first year of this series of workshops. And you see uh, a key point was discussed, which was this idea of a potential for 
creation in opposition to the current logic of a potential for extraction. So we had this workshop, a bunch of great participants. It was great, but like a lot of workshops, you came out of it with feeling like, okay, we had these great interesting ideas, but that's kind of it and not really much happens yet. Fast forward a couple of months to the next workshop in the series, which is called Autonomous Agents for Regenerative Ecologies, where we were now looking at the idea of how machines could perform um, uh, without direct human supervision, uh, automated processes to enhance or enable ecological regeneration. And so the question here was really the extent to which autonomy would be possible or even desirable. And we worked with uh, a little set of cards kind of based on UML um, to work out some of these processes and also using this as a tool to kind of demonstrate and surface some of the issues around having automated systems do this kind of work. You very kindly quickly figure out that it's not a matter of um, if this then that decision making and these kind of things. However, uh, in one of these groups, uh, a, the group that had class cards and Brauer in it, um, this idea of the bio co-op was taken from the previous workshop and they actually ran with it and gamed it out further, looking at uh, how they could take this idea and uh, use it to transform a community over time from being egocentric to what they then termed ecocentric. And one of the participants in this workshop has now become one of the farmers who is actually one of the protozoops. Um, a third workshop in the series happens. I kind of want to wrap this bit up a little bit, but this was a narrative storytelling workshop where I was one of the coaches. Uh, but it was here uh, that the story was further developed again. This time, uh, the bio co-op became, I think it was a Chinese restaurant that was operating for generations on these principles. And uh, Klaus Kaudzebrauer and I were talking about this idea and, um, he told me, and I very much agreed with him, that at this point he felt that the concept needed to go, needed to escape from these workshops, that it would really start to get interesting if we tried to actually make this thing exist. Um, and it's at that point that it became uh, the ZOOP project. So Klaus Kautzenbrauer uh, is a colleague who I've worked with throughout this project. He's a researcher at Het Nieuwe Instituut in Rotterdam. Um, and he decided, okay, I'm gonna take this idea and make it part of the program for all of next year at a new institute. And this became the Neuhaus Zoop Research Facility, which was a large part of an exhibition at a new institute. There were works there like uh, Deep Steward, uh, an AI that was training itself to recognize organisms in the pond outside, a work by Ian Ingram and Tom Carlson. Um, there was a data fusion instrument, as it was called, to do remote observations made by uh, an NGO called Space for Good. But the important part uh, for us was also throughout the whole year of 2019, we had a series of ZOOP workshops that uh, were no longer about a purely fictional idea, but now really about the implementation of how do we actually want to do this. So we started working with uh, legal experts, farmers, um, ecologists, uh, a range of various soil builders, be they farmers or uh, holders of food forests, um, to think about these ideas of, okay, how could we legally represent uh, what we were then calling collective bodies of non-humans? Um, how would we measure ecological development? Um, there was a session on designing prototypes for zoonomic instruments to do this measurement in which we uh, kind of quickly figured out that we weren't really talking about toolkits like what Arduino sensors to use, but uh, what kind of methods and means of communication would be needed to develop this idea. Um, so four of these workshops happened throughout 2019 in which kind of the groundwork uh, for this idea was laid. But in parallel to that, we also still wanted to keep exploring the more uh, fictional, futuristic, further out aspects of this idea. Um, and, uh, so this became uh, the first really large uh, fictional workshop that we did in the series, which was called uh, Zoonomic Futures, um, 
which uh, was commissioned for the Ruth Rianiawa in Bochum and uh, used uh, an overarching immersive narrative and collaborative speculative crafting exercises together as a way around which um, to package uh, a kind of role play in which uh, participants would take the role of humans and non-human representatives as they imagined future multi-species cultures. Uh, so here's a timeline of the performance structure. I'm not going to go too deeply into all of this. You can ask me later in questions. But what we did is we set out a future scenario through a world that we performed uh, through narration, uh, sound, and visuals. Uh, inside of that, in response to the overarching narrative, was a, a co-creative workshop packaged in which participants would build their communities within this world in response to events happening as part of the plot. And then within that, we had designed a kind of log sheet system, which uh, was both helpful for the participants to be able to recount their stories at the end of the workshop. And for us, it was a research output, uh, which we could use as prompts for interviewing participants after the fact. Um, so to give you an idea of how this whole thing went, I'm going to give you an overview of the, the story structure. So this thing is narrated by Klaus Kautabrau and myself. There is a live soundscape running and we're using visuals to depict uh, a world that we introduce our participants into. Uh, this is a floating platform somewhere on the ocean in the late 21st century. Um, these people are kind of shipwrecked there, they wake up. Uh, there's life there, it's familiar, but also uncanny. Um, they're not sure how to deal with it. But the participants undergo a collective initiation ritual. They're set up into groups within the story structure, and they begin collectively to build um, the habitats that will represent their future societies. Uh, and then throughout the workshop, we have them answer a timed series of envelopes that contain the further background information for the scenario, cards describing specifics that each group encounters, and most importantly, in the first envelope, the cards for the roles of human representative and non-human representative within these groups. And that's what they carry forward through the whole thing um, in thinking about the ways that their cultures are formed. Uh, and each group also has someone to log these instances. Each package contains uh, its own log sheet. And that's what, uh, as I said, we would use to, to collect our, uh, well, research outputs. Um, so the first act sets this up, introduces the participants to the idea, sets them up in their roles, um, and they start to build these structures. And usually at this point, they uh, look kind of like this guy here who has a bit of a confused face on. They're not really 100% sure what happens. And that's when we start uh, actually developing the story. Things start happening to them slowly uh, the atmosphere in the background starts to build um, thunder cracks and it becomes apparent that they are now faced with a storm. The participants are all made to move their flimsy cardboard constructions around through the workspace. Uh, most of them break, which is great. Um, and each group is then faced, thrown into crisis, faced with some kind of threat. And the question becomes, um, how do you decide now in the survival situation who lives uh, and who dies? Uh, so uh, the story becomes about uh, how these groups with human and non-human representation, it starts to boil down to who eats who and who dies and why. Uh, it's about an, a, a future ethics within which that non-human is represented um, and how they go about building that together. So the story develops, uh, time passes, decades, then generations. We introduce new prompts to the world. The question goes from a, a matter of survival to how you build quality of life. Um, as new technologies are introduced, what are the costs involved with those? Uh, quality of life is improving, sure, but for whom and how? Um, so and all the while, these things are being discussed from these varying perspectives of uh, human representatives and those representing non-human life. So then in the end, we bring our groups uh, back together uh, to have them kind of exchange ideas, evaluate strengths and weaknesses, 
and explore the opportunities for zoonomic exchange and see what parts of each other's uh, cultures they want to take from each other. Um, so here's a selection of kind of the cardboard castles that uh, people built. Um, and I want to point out or kind of stress at this point that the building of these models isn't necessarily uh, the point of the workshop. We're not trying to create, you know, like architectural model futures here. These are kind of the campfire around which um, the participants have these discussions. So the materials are also created uh, are selected to create things that function at a scale where they're about a meter square in uh, surface area so that you can sit a group of five or six people comfortably around it. Um, but I wanna pull out and highlight two of these cases in particular that demonstrate kind of the extremes of where groups end up going when they go through this. So this structure was created by a group calling themselves Funga Sutra. Uh, Funga Sutra as a culture that uh, alters their microbiome by growing fungus on their skins to uh, symbiotically satiate the human need for consumption. Um, they eventually merge with this other species with which they cohabitate and just give up their humanity entirely. So this group took a very uh, philosophical and biology based approach. And uh, a participant that I interviewed from this group described the experience as being very profound and enabling and uh, she said it developed in organic, creative ways and left her with a very tear and, uh, uh, tender and dear memory of this experience. And on the other hand, here we have uh, a group called the Pomfino Donut, um, a very beautifully crafted installation. And this group focused on extending human lifespan long enough to create self-sustaining systems for when humans would no longer exist. They said their highest value was species diversity, but they had taken a very uh, technical solutions-based approach to the challenges in the story. And an uh, interviewee from this group, um, what she said about this was uh, like, it was like we made a bad zoo. She felt that they had just replicated a bunch of human institutions and wasn't super happy with the outcomes at all. Um, she, was, she was quite annoyed by this process. And when these, two groups were brought together for the zoonomic exchange at the end of the workshop, um, they found that the cultures they had developed were actually completely irreconcilable. Um, they decided on some kind of sort of student exchange program. Um, but the participant from the Funga Sutra group told me, uh, we became so extreme, we had difficulties merging or even communicating with the other group. We realized, wow, we've really traveled off in a completely different direction. Um, so these are broadly the two main flavors of final outcome that we see, and they're uh, always somewhat mixed, but you get either this technical approach attempting to solve the problems that we set up in the story world with something that resembles what we would call a circular economy, like full use of resources, everything is recycled, the loop is closed in an elaborate system. Um, and the second approach is this more philosophical idea, concluding that we need to leave behind a human perspective altogether uh, through evolution, mutation, communication, or uh, some kind of transcendental experience in uh, communing with the non-human. Um, but what it ends up being is a case of the, the right to add legitimacy from a strictly human perspective is, is lost. Um, so in both cases, there's an element of increased ecological awareness, but one assumes there's a problem that can be solved and the other moves into the inevitability of existence beyond the human point of view uh, and solves the problem in the way that if there's no human problem, you also don't need to solve it. And we also see this reflected in the strategies that people have personally for representing the non-human where uh, one thing we see a lot of participants do because we don't make it very clear what their role is specifically. We let that we let them fill that in for themselves. So what a lot of people will do is pick a very specific animal or organism to represent and say, I am seaweed now, or I am the algae, and force themselves into the role in that way. Um, whereas others will uh, do it through uh, recreating or re-representing human represent representational structures for the non-human. So we would get ideas like uh, the dolphin court or, um, the sludge pool of justice or whatever it may be. 
through which they would solve these kind of things. So this was a very interesting workshop series that we performed um, at the Ruhr Trianiale in Bochum. And then uh, as one of the last things that happened before everyone got locked down this year, we were no longer able to do workshops like this in February at, at New Institute. Um, but meanwhile, in 2020, uh, back in the real world, the Zorb concept had still been continually developed also. I need to be very clear at this point that um, the work that I'm doing is really only a very small chunk of a much larger project, mostly being led by Klaus Gautenbrauer, but at this point constituting a network of uh, 10, 20, maybe 30 people in various different capacities interacting with this in different ways. Uh, the most important development throughout 2020 with regards to the ZOA project is that um, a very large law firm in the Netherlands, uh, De Brouw, Blackstone and Westbrook, who have like 60 partners and 300 associates, uh, have taken on drawing up the statutes for the Zoop Foundation as a pro bono case. And uh, from what I'm told, they are taking it extremely seriously. Um, and it turns out that in those four workshops that we did last year, where we invited uh, some legal advisors and various people to think about these things, we actually did a pretty good job and they've actually been able to work with our notes and the structure that we proposed is turning out to actually be uh, something that is legally largely sound and will be developed. Um, so besides my work, uh, the ZOOP methods are also still being worked on at a new institute. It was supposed to be a large part of the uh, Dutch contribution to the Venice Biennial this year, which also, again, um, that has gone slightly differently, but Klaus has worked with groups in um, Poof, where Berlin, Venice, France, I believe, on drawing up the first version of the zoonomic method, which is uh, four stages in initiating a zoop, the demarcating of the area, observing and sensing, taking the time to uh, take a step back and see what's actually going on there, uh, characterizing the nature of the relationships within the space, and then finally, as a last step, deciding how to intervene for the benefit of that space. Uh, this document, I think, will be available in a few weeks' time. If you're interested in that, you'll be able to pick it up through the new institute. Um, but for my part, to come back to my contribution to uh, the Zoop network, uh, I was invited this year to do a workshop for Impact Festival which um, normally is based in Utrecht, but now everything is based anywhere there's internet, you know how that goes. Um, so during last year, having in our practical workshops explored the very near, um, more tactical, what are we going to do? How are we setting it up? And then together with class in the Zoonomic Futures Workshop, having explored a reality or irreality that we threw to the late 21st century and kind of threw magical technologies at to be able to push people out into a much um, further away imaginative space. I kind of wanted to pull into an area between those two and build on a scenario that would be uh, more um, short to medium term, more immediately uh, plausible and address a, a current issue. So um, what we designed, and again, I worked with class on this, is a workshop that I called Marine Zoonomy, where we uh, explored the idea of using um, or decommissioning oil rigs and uh, fossil fuel infrastructure in the North Sea as hubs around which to locate um, marine permaculture or regenerative aquacultures. Um, not necessarily to meet some climate goal or get to a zero footprint or whatever, but to, to, to imagine a radically alternative way of living with these infrastructures and transforming the economic logic uh, around them. Um, so this, uh, as things do nowadays, ended up being a series of workshops on Zoom, um, which were weekly throughout October this year. Every week we did a two hour session um, to keep it nice and within everyone's, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, capacity for concentration. This is split into three sessions, mapping, succession, and effects. Uh, and each session was uh, consisted of a host introduction, some time for participant introductions or reflections, then an update of the scenario, uh, uh, a small expert presentation by one of our participants. Then uh, the workshop itself would consist of an hour to an hour and 20 minutes, basically of group conversation, where we used Miro as an ambient note-taking layer. Um, and then there would be some closing words and an after hour discussion. Um, so this workshop series actually went really, really well. Um, and I think that's largely due to uh, our extreme fortune with the very high quality of participants that we had here. Um, we tried to keep our level of participants quite low. Um, I think there was uh, like 15 in total and three of us are involved with the organization. Um, and this choice was made to avoid um, throwing people into breakout rooms and all the time that gets lost with that and uh, really keep everyone centered around one single conversation. Um, so a small number of participants, not too long a time, but this was actually uh, still allowed for very rich, deep discussions because of the expertise we have in the zoo room that you see in front of you. There's uh, Celine Treviso, who is an expert in um, marine law. Um, Rudy, the guy you can see with the hide hat, he has 25 years of experience of working on oil rigs. Uh, we had Joost, who is a design researcher now turned seaweed farmer, who is actually doing it. Um, um, Sherry Wasserman's expertise from her PhD, uh, studying things like the people uh, creating artificial reefs in Biosphere 2 was extremely valuable. So this, this combination of people led to a really rich discussion over the three weeks. Um, the first session, of course, the, as I said, consisted of mapping, where we looked at the existing uh, technologies and trends. Um, and after each workshop, what Klaus and I would do is a kind of a post-game analysis and uh, a lot of extra work then would go into designing the Miro board for the next week, um, where we would pre-populate some stuff so that people didn't have to start from scratch, um, but also each week take what was said uh, in the workshop by our various experts, the discussions that they had, and use that to flesh out the scenario um, uh, add more life and structure to it so that every week when a new session begun, we would recap them on where we were. And with this, we could kind of push through things like in the first session, a lot of the legal challenges and barriers were thrown up. Um, there's a lot of existing legislation around how you could use one of these structures. So a large part of that workshop was really just lost to the problem of how can you even do this? Um, so to not lose that time again, we would set up the second workshop saying, okay, this has been solved in this way. Now, how do we move forward? Um, so then in the third week, we looked at further order effects and consequences each week with a mirror board and a pre-set up structure. Um, you can hear a lot more about this workshop uh, if you just go to the Impact Festival YouTube channel. You can watch a full hour um, presentation and Q&A of our results from this. Um, and that's kind of brings us up to where we are now, where uh, kind of the broader points I want to make about uh, what we're doing with this thing and the whole project. Um, with the Marine Zoonomy Workshop in particular, what became really clear was the value of bringing people together operating in different research silos. We had people in there as well from uh, the offshore renewable energy industry who were super excited to be hearing different perspectives uh, and discovering new opportunities for the way that they could develop from a business point of view. Um, people from kind of the more land-based uh, farm aspect of it uh, being very enthusiastic about the added potential for carbon capture that there was in, in the marine situation. Um, so these workshops have a lot of value uh, in some cases, in, um, if it's something like zoonomic futures and giving people this uh, kind of a, a sort of an embodied experience of a different uh, perspective, but when it's something like marine zoonomy where it's much closer to the real, uh, it really raises a lot of enthusiasm and people 
about the fact that this can be done. You can go ahead and actually do these things. Um, but it is a, a, a long-term effort. We've been workshopping around this for uh, about three years now. And I think it's as of early next year, the legal foundation will actually be, be set. The first zoonomic foundation will be set up um, and the first zoops will start to operate legally uh, under that name. And that includes uh, a number of food forests, uh, some farms, but also University College Utrecht had their Zoop Sprouting Festival a few weeks ago, and they're becoming the first educational institution to be a Zoop. Uh, the new institute in Rotterdam itself wants to be a Zoop. We have a hotel that wants to become a Zoop. Um, so yeah, all of these things are going to start moving forward, and the challenges that we're starting to face now are um, uh, really uh, issues of scale um, and becoming a real organization with organizational structures and procedures and being able to onboard people um, without having to walk them through this whole three years of research that we've already done. Just stuff like drawing up FAQs, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the, the, the real uh, work is kind of more in the real world at this point. But uh, my practice of exploring futures in this way is always going to play a part within the Zoop project as that's where its origins lie. And we're always going to be looking for uh, new niches, um, new ways to engage people with this project and, and through which to uh, kind of explore these new ways of thinking about uh, our relationship with the natural systems within which we live. Um, and with that, I've had a half an hour of talking so I'm going to throw to questions. You can see this on the recording where to find out more and see more of my work. Uh, let's stop the share and um, I'll throw back to Lara. Great, fantastic. Can everyone give Chef a big round of applause or jazz hands or whatever you particularly like to do on Zoom? to show a massive appreciation for that work that I find personally phenomenally interesting. And it was brilliant to get down into a really detailed kind of exploration of that. So if you want to, um, you can either put your whole question in the chat or just signal that you have a question and then I'll come to you if you prefer to ask it in your embodied form, um, whether that's uh, creaturely or human. Um, but Grace has a question. How is this different to rights of nature? For example, what has been done in Ecuador? Honestly, I can't speak to that because I'm not familiar with rights to nature, what has been done in Ecuador. Um, there are a lot of, I can say there are a lot of things that are thinking along similar lines to this. Um, what uh, distinguishes this project right now in particular is that we are, um, well, there's two things. We first thought about a long-term project in which we really wanted to instantiate a, uh, like a real, a completely novel legal form um, that would incorporate these rights for non-humans. We started talking to legal experts and they were like, okay, unless you have like 17 years and several tens of millions of dollars and you want to live your life lobbying the EU, don't do that. But we think we can cobble together this construction out of existing legal, uh, existing frameworks that would kind of give you the same effect. So we're just trying to use the structures within Dutch law that don't give rights but um, enable an organization that has these goals uh, registered in such a way that uh, if, if uh, some organization enters a partnership with a zoonomic foundation that they are then bound to those statutes. So a lot of kind of the farms and food forests that we already work with, they already, it won't change the way they operate. This is already the way they think, um, but it kind of, uh, legally enshrines these standpoints. And the um, longer term strategy for this is that if you do want to make that uh, 
real um, instantiation of a new kind of incorporation that we were initially thinking about. Doing it in this way, if we have these ops running for seven, 10, 15 years, then gives you 10 to 15 years of precedent of it having been done that way, and it becomes much easier to make that jump. But that's kind of long-term stuff. How this differs from what they're doing in Ecuador, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't tell you. If no one else has a question, I'd gladly follow up on that and kind of, I'm really interested in how there's this kind of recursivity between what you call like the futures work and then the mm. real and the way that they inform each other is re mm. this really beautiful pleat of kind of going further out into the ethical terrain and then coming back to like the kind of practical action. Like I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you kind of conceptualize that work. Has that kind of been accidental or was it planned or what are the kind of benefits of working in that way? Well, the, um, the initial split uh, is kind of accidental. We had the real world, if you will, Zoop workshops program set up and we were asked to do a workshop for the Ruotrianiale where we were initially asked to do a, a thing about a looping orbiter asteroid, um, where <laughs> that had a society in it. It's like, okay, <laughs> but we we're doing this Zoop thing. Can we do that instead? Um, but we still wanted to throw to a future slightly further out than planning for your own current lifespan so that you can kind of get away with hand waving a little bit. Um, and that created this split between um, kind of an immediate and a much further future that I then wanted to uh, move back into. So that kind of happened by accident. But um, then for me wanting to move to a more near term thing, um, I guess really my ideas about this are best expressed in a blog post, that are, a drunk blog post that I wrote four years ago about the futures code. I'm sure <laughs> several of you are familiar with this idea. Um, but that there's uh, a probable, plausible, and possible futures. Uh, and that uh, through uh, thinking about the future and then acting in the present, um, there are various timelines splintering off in all kinds of different ways from your point of view of the future. Um, but the idea of um, inflection points at which you can pull those strings uh, and pull your future that's way out somewhere here and the possible towards the plausible by yanking on it here and making those things come closer. So that's kind of the way it's working in my mind and this is a vastly more complex thing than that will ever be represented by that stupid cone. Um, but it's yeah uh, uh, and I mean this is a very basic idea action in the present causes the future is only the stuff that we did before that right that's um, once you get there. So um, yeah, that, I'm not sure if that's a clear or a vague answer. I'm sure that for some people, there's a picture in their mind that is very clear and other people are like, what are you talking about? I think Anne's asked quite a complex question. I might ask her to un unmute maybe and, and Ask I'm happy, happy to try and voice it. I wasn't even quite sure what I'd written in the end. <laughs> Possibly um, you've actually just answered it. But as I was listening to you, I was struck by the way that when we're talking about sort of national level legislation, mm. it, it's out. I mean, it's as you say, it's a huge lobbying act and it's outside our grasp. What really strikes me that I love about this so much is that you're, you seem to be creating structures at an actionable level. And then I was kind of, what did I actually say? Yeah, so it speaks to the bigger world and all these supply chains and this kind of mesh of everything, but it's uh, something that's sort of local and global and national. Um, so I just wondered if you could say more about the way that you kept it at an actionable level and whether that was also part of how you came at it. And then you were sort of answering that. So, the, but I'm sure there's more to say. So I'd be really interested, if perhaps the issue of scale here. Yeah, well, that's the, the, the issue of scale is what we're starting to run up against now. Um, but this idea, because um, of course, uh, uh, in the end, the real practice of uh, being a ZOOP is just uh, what a lot of 
communities of soil builders, farms, et cetera, are already doing, and it's just kind of a care for land and landscape and, and, and that around them. So that's, we don't really actually change what those kinds of people are doing. But um, we wanted to uh, devise some kind of intervention that would work at the systems level um, and then be something that could um, like franchise is a bad metaphor, but uh, work in this way, something that could be rubber stamped across um, that would be uh, uh, kind of a simple set of guidelines, or just a, a, a jacket that an organization could wear that would have it operate in, in a certain way, if that makes sense. So that was, the goal was to do something that would be uh, implementable on a systems level and have those kind of local effects. Um, and also still give the room for each of these ZOOPs to very much be their own organization. Because uh, we have a pretty broad diversity of what there is now. Um, and this was something that was also uh, very much fought for and over in the workshops last year where we had, for example, a regenerative farmer who was doing great work, but was approaching it very much from a uh, farm systems perspective. And uh, Deborah Solomon, who was an artist and researcher uh, at the University of Amsterdam, um, multi-species urbanism is her uh, catch term, I believe, um, was very much arguing for, no, this needs some, to be something that um, could, for example, be adopted by a group of farmers somewhere in South America, or that would not uh, restrict itself in that way. So while we are right now uh, operating within the Dutch legal framework, because we're a Dutch organization and you have to start somewhere, the, it is, um, we are thinking about having it designed the methods and core philosophy in such a way that it can be translated to wherever else. And that those bridges then I guess will we'll cross when we come to them. I hope that answers a little more. I could be yeah, more specific you. about That's details. really interesting, thanks. As a follow-up, I think it's really interesting that you just told that little offhand comment, or if you tried to approach that from a strictly legal standpoint, you know, the pathway through the legalities, you know, would be these people would say, oh, that's not possible. Like, is there something about bringing together these interdisciplinary perspectives in this speculative space that kind of opens up the possible between silos and beyond them? Like yeah, that's there, really, there is. That's a really you know, it's easy to just think, oh, we just invited a bunch of people to a workshop, but that, that work of curating people and expertise is, is really valuable and under-recognized. I'd love it if is you a, could say something about that. Well, that was a conscious part of the design of the workshop. We don't just throw out an open call and hope that people show up. We had a list of various functions and knowledges that we wanted to have on board. And we did invite some people specifically for those things. And in some cases, we just got really, really lucky, like that a guy shows up that is managing a, a, a renewable energy innovation program that has a 2050 vision. And, you know, the, uh, you can't, yeah, we didn't plan for that. But he just showed up in the workshop and paid to be there three weeks in a row. It was great. Um, and we even had him present uh, several projects in, in one of the, um, one of the sessions. Um, but this, uh, yeah, the, the, the breaking open of those silos, the kind of the, the interdisciplinarity and hybridity, I guess it is, um, these workshops are valuable in, um, yeah, for, for these kind of people who come from a business perspective that honestly we haven't really operated much with because we are mostly still safe in our arts and design context, um, which is another thing we're going to have to contend with in the near future. Um, but um, a lot of those people are also very excited to be able to talk about these possibilities because of the way that 
of the way that legislation and industry now currently works. For example, in the North Sea, there are huge areas that are designated as this is a nature preserve, and then huge areas that are designated as and this is for windmills and renewable energy. And you're thinking like, yeah, okay, but why not both? Why isn't the windmill area also a nature preserve in some way? It offers habitat. There's a lot you could be doing there. Why aren't these functions combined? And it's just because of the way that these systems are uh, legislated and managed for a certain kind of maximizing for a very particular kind of value, other kinds of value aren't considered. So then having these various perspectives in a workshop can very much uh, open up possibility. And, but from there, it's just a matter of uh, who was it landing with? Is that someone who then gets excited and also has agency within that field to make things happen there? Who knows? But yeah. Yeah, that's that question about other forms of value, I think is just so present as we think as part of the Creatures Project about, you know, what enables artistic and creative agencies in the world. Um, Namq, do you want to unmute and explain? I think you're going to need to give a bit of context because we don't have time maybe to follow the link. Yes. So thank you very much for the presentation. And then it reminded me a lot of this uh, project that I actually studied called Far Farm. And then without going further about the project, I guess you can just check the link. But uh, I found that quite interesting that this, the, maybe the Dutch, the context maybe has a something that maybe it doesn't have in the other context. Seems like many activities similar to what you have, or even this project that I'm referring to, has many things happening or governed or funded by Dutch organization, et cetera. Yeah. So do you, can you say a little bit about maybe the, the peculiarity or the infrastructure sure. maybe? Yeah. Well, what, what the, the, the luck that we have honestly is that the Netherlands, even after the, the funding massacres in 2009 and 2010 still has a somewhat functioning uh, infrastructure for funding the arts. And we've been able to uh, develop this project um, largely on people working on time from arts grants and funding. Things like uh, Tom Carlos's um, Deep Steward project with uh, the AI vision recognizing species on its own in the pond is funded out of funding from Stimulating Fonds Creative Industry. Um, but also the fact that uh, we have institutions like the new institute where Klaus Kautenbrau is employed full time and he is therefore able to put a large portion of his time as his full time job into uh, moving this organization and this organizational forum forward. If that hadn't been there, this kind of wouldn't be able to uh, exist in this way. So yeah, it is that's particular to the Dutch context that you can do this kind of thing um, behind the veil of arts funding. And that has been our short-term strategy for existing. And it's part of the scaling up challenges that we have now is we're going to find, need to find a way uh, to move this out into a, a very different kind of money, if you know what I mean. The, it's going to have to end up now being uh, an EU project um, unfortunately, cap reforms aren't looking good, but that was a place that we were looking at for um, um, developing this in the context of uh, agricultural policy funding, or we might even um, have to really uh, look at um, financing for, um, well, the, the world of real finance, where something like this could become part of uh, um, Risk mitigation strategy, uh, risk mitigation, yeah, risk mitigation strategy, um, where uh, operating in this way because of the ecological benefits that it would have, would be something that would create value and preventing value from being lost, and somehow financially that makes sense to the tune of billions a year. I don't know how these things work, um, not entirely, but yeah, that's that's kind of what we're facing now is that we're going to need to get out from behind arts funding because there's just an order of magnitude of money to run an organization like this has the potential to become that is very different from what it is now, which has its whole own set of dangers and challenges. Yeah. 
So I'm going to clean the last question. Yeah, um, as a fellow traveler down the multi species ethics route, I wanted to ask you a question about the series of workshops where you, I mean, first of all, I think this is really important work because many of us are really into ecofeminist perspectives where we're working towards a world of multi-species flourishings but i think as you've pointed out in your more speculative series of workshops actually there are situations where an idea of rights from the kind of human world like just doesn't translate because you know something around who gets the food, whose population grows, those are situations where there are real antagonisms. And I'm really interested in kind of, like now that you've done these series of workshops and you've sort of seen how people act, like what methods did you use to kind of analyze your workshop to, to set out these ethical positions? And what are you kind of going to do with that now? Is it going to, does it inform the zoop or is it going to exit the zoop in its own piece of writing or something? I'm really curious. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, well, that workshop in particular, I have a bunch of it written up in one form that I will rewrite before it becomes a public uh, thing, but there will be that, that story that we tell um with visuals and pictures involved that will come out and uh in terms of methods uh for analysis this was um uh, largely the tedious task of taking all of these log sheets which by the way always put on your things to have people please answer them in block letters because the handwriting <laughs> is just... but um but trying to get i i really took all of these things, put them into a big old massive spreadsheet. Um, and we talked them over to kind of pull out the, the patterns that we could recognize, which gave us these, okay, these are the two broadly points that people seem to uh, gravitate towards. Um, but how that in particular feeds back into the Zor project is kind of in the way of, um, it informs a bit how we talk about this idea publicly and the ways in which we actually describe the Zoop have changed significantly. Um, mm, and um, a question we uh, often get is also locked into that idea of um, these struggles, um, uh, they always come from the fact that uh, there's no getting around the fact that we are humans in the end. We can talk about non-human representation all you want, but it's still humans doing the representing. So it's, it's still kind of very human centric. Um, um, so, uh, and this has been, uh, this was brought up in the very first workshop and it's been an issue ever since. And we don't really have any, uh, solid answers for that yet other than um that uh, uh, even stuck in your your human role it helps to um imagine and try to inhabit these perspectives to try to take on board something of um, how you might be thinking differently about the the values and the relationships that you hold with these things now I'm not sure if I'm actually answering your question so I'm gonna yeah you... no massively I think it's okay. really interesting that it has informed like in a way the politics of the project, like the way you kind of communicate, especially as you scale up and as, as an organization, now you've got these points of translation outside of creative practice. It's going to become, once there's a bunch of these things, uh, all of these people are going to be telling their own Zoop stories, right? So that's, mm. that's a thing I have in mind for future research as well, is now I'm kind of doing uh, futures ethnographies on what people think about how this could develop, but give it a couple of years and you're just going to be able to do real world zoo ethnographies of, on, on, no, what is the story that people are actually telling on the ground in all these different situations. So I'm also excited for that um, to start happening and hopefully I can find that what part of, find a way to make that part of my ongoing practice as well. Brilliant, well, I think, we probably need to leave our session there.